One by one, let's get this panel up here. Starting with Nomi Prinz, journalist, senior fellow at Demos, as we've heard, author of the book at Center Stage tonight. What a title, right? It takes a pillage behind the bailouts, bonuses, and backroom deals from Washington to Wall Street. You can start working your way up. It's also author of Other People's Money, The Corporate Mugging of America. We get some great titles among all the panelists tonight, you'll see. Now, before turning to journalism, as we heard, Nomi worked on Wall Street, managing director of, in fact, Goldman Sachs, and ran um, International Analytics Group at Bear Stearns at one point. So she's playing for the other team now, and we're going to hear from her. Let's welcome Nomi Prince. Come on up here, Dan Gross, senior editor at Newsweek, one of the most prominent financial, economic, and business writers being read across the world today. He used to write Economic View column in the New York Times, you must remember that, and has contributed to Fortune, Wired, New Republic, Bloomberg News, lots of places. And actually, his book uh, a few months ago came out first electronically, so I stuck it on the Kindle, and I never go anywhere without it. It's called Dumb Money, How Our Greatest Financial Minds Bankrupted the Nation. Dan Gross. Matt, come on up here. Matt Taibbi, writer for Rolling Stone. You've probably seen his Road Rage column. And you saw it this summer, right? That great piece about Goldman Sachs and the Rolling Stones called The Great American Bubble Machine. It is wild reading. If you haven't seen it, it's easily available online. Uh, Covered the 2008 election. He used to be on Maher all the time. And uh, one of his quotes that keeps me awake at night uh, he refers to a loophole in our system. Just a little loophole. It's, it's that famous loophole that organized greed always defeats disorganized democracy. Obviously, we have a challenge. Matt Taibbi. <clears throat> All righty, so... Since your book is the most recent, I'll start with you, Nomi, if I may. Former Wall Street banker, you know how this stuff works from the inside. And judging from the strong criticisms in it, takes a pillage. And in your previous books, uh, I bet you're not surprised by what we've seen. But for the average person who hasn't worked at Goldman Sachs, give us a quick sense of what is the Wall Street game as you describe it, that they're up to? Um, Well, there's the game that happens inside of the walls of Wall Street, of 85 Broad Street, which is where Goldman Sachs is and all the other firms. And then there's the game as it sort of manifests itself all the way up the chain from Wall Street um, to Washington. Um, And I'm just going to give a teeny little snippet of the mentality inside because it it really does extend to um, everything else. So I'll tell you how how much taking credit and playing the game in Wall Street actually matters. Um, It's it's a strategy. It's like almost militaristic. Um, uh, Right before I left Goldman, I was um, running a group. Uh, that was creating all sorts of esoteric things, some of which became known later as toxic assets. The details don't matter. They were making a lot of money um, at the time for, for Goldman. And what happens is internally you have lots of different groups and lots of different groups fight to get up to the top of Goldman to, so that senior management will give credit to the people who really, really created the trade and made the money. And so there's a lot of fighting going on. So I'm sitting one day in the office of the head of sales and what I thought was my group had just done this trade and it had an insurance company involved and it had Japan involved and it had currencies and commodities and it was just all this kind of mess of stuff so you really couldn't figure out who created it or what it was about. Um, So did one of the other managers um, that was competing to move up the the chain. So I'm sitting in an office and and George, the head of sales, says to me, you know what, Harvey's walking up the stairs right now and he's going to go into Lloyd's office. Lloyd is now the CEO of Goldman Sachs at the time he was um, running FIC, which was the Fixed Income Currency and Commodities Division. And what you need to do is you need to take the other route around the trading floor so that you can get into Lloyd's office before Harvey goes up the stairs into Lloyd's office and takes credit for the trade that your group is working on. And I'm like, I'm hesitating. He's like, go, go. 
Um, needless to say, I actually, I actually didn't make it in time. Um, it, it turned out I, I wasn't as good. You know, Harry was also very big, and he was motivated. And he, he, he ultimately um, you know, rose up the chain, as did Lloyd, and, and, and everybody became happy. But, but the point is, there's an actual strategy on a regular basis, not just to take credit for a trade, but to actually maneuver to do it and have the conversation, get in front. And that manifests itself throughout entire groups and entire companies on Wall Street. And ultimately, it, 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 it pervades Wall Street and goes into Washington. When people go from Wall Street to Washington, such as the Treasury Secretary last year when TARP was, was created, uh, Henry Paulson, when he becomes basically CEO of the Treasury from CEO of Goldman Sachs, that mentality continues. How much can I commandeer of whatever money is on the table in order to do what it is I want to do and then take credit for it? Um, and that's kind of a lot of the philosophy that goes from Wall Street to Washington and has really been a part of why ultimately Wall Street got so much from Washington in this bailout, and we'll talk about the numbers, I guess, in a little bit, because that's the game. The same game that's running to an office to get money at that particular moment and credit for a trade is the same game that's trying to get that money into your company for your merger from the Treasury and from the American public. It's, it's really the same mentality, um, and, and here we are. In, in Matt's piece from the summer, he talks about the old Goldman Sachs, certainly way before you got there, Nomi. And, uh, and, and the, the operating philosophy in the great, great old days was something like greed, but long term. The idea was we're not going to do anything that's disruptive to the wider system. We're going to do stuff that is in the longer term interests of the company and presumably longer term interests of everybody else. Doesn't sound like the philosophy that you were indoctrinated into when you got there. Now, there's instant gratification is like huge on, on Wall Street. It's as instant as that moment in that trade or that quarter's result or that bonus that year. It's, it's very much about right now. Um, and, and it has become about right now. Every single day it's more about right now. So you can imagine sort of the acceleration of this, of this idea. And, and old school there was some idea of we'll build something, we'll take profit from it, we'll make money in the long haul, we're a part of this thing forever or, 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 or something or some, some sense of forever. And now it's very much like this bonus this year, this trade right now. Nobody, as you hear, focuses her firepower on you know the big big finance, big B, big F. But Dan, I want to ask you about this. The president was down on Wall Street just a couple weeks ago, briefly made that stop, made that speech at uh, Federal Hall, and the president of the United States described this thing that we've been living through as quote a collective failure of responsibility across America. As a matter of culpability and consequences, the term collective responsibility, in a way, has been read by, that's what I heard, gee, we're all, the fault, dear Brutus, lies within ourselves. You know, maybe I wanted to buy a house, and maybe I got a mortgage that was a little um, too cheap, mm -hmm. and maybe riskier than one should have. Do you think that's fair? That, in fact, you know, we're kind of all complicit in this, and we shouldn't point such... Uh, powerful rhetoric at the big guys. Well, I think it's, you know, it's 80% right and 100% wrong, which is to say that, you know, there are two sides to every trade. For every loan, there was a borrower. There were a fair number of borrowers who you know, maybe should have known better or didn't take the time to do what Susie Orman tells them to do and read the fine print. <laughs> there were speculators who were buying their eighth and ninth and tenth condo with no money down. But, you know, my wife often says, uh, uses the example of, say we're in a house and everybody starts yelling, me and my two children. Um, me being the adult should know better and should control my temper, whereas they are children and don't have the experience in life to control themselves. This is not to say that Americans are children, but when you look at the hierarchy um, and the mistakes that were made, and you know what I try to lay out in my book that it, it wasn't done by the least of us. This was done by the most of us. Um, it was the most well-respected economist uh, in the world. The, most, the, the guy who was regarded as the best central banker perhaps in history, Alan Greenspan, who got so much of this wrong and laid the foundation for this. It was the top firms. It wasn't the, the bad firms on Wall Street. It was the ones with the highest reputation where everybody wanted to work that got it wrong. And you can go on down the road. So this was you know, was there culpability by people who borrowed money they shouldn't have? Yes, it's, it's not smart to borrow money you can't pay back. But, you know, we had a decade where there was no uh, growth in income. The median income did not rise between 1999 and 2008. 
and the cost of other things like housing and education and health care, uh, gas, food, was, ri was rising quite rapidly. Uh, so a lot of people were forced into debt um, by necessity, or what they felt was necessity, and they would not have been able to go into debt had not Wall Street been standing there um, telling them that they had gold in their backyard. I, I use the example that um, you know, it was like the Beverly Hillbillies where they found black gold in their backyard. We <laughs> were told that we had these reservoirs of capital, namely home equity, uh, in your backyard, in your house, and Wall Street was standing there ready to help us with the equipment uh, to tap it, give us a home equity line of credit or a second mortgage or a refinancing. And the greatest economic minds of our day were telling us that this all made perfect sense. Matt, when you hear this idea of collective responsibility, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree with Dan 100% on this. I think, you know, since, um, since I started doing this kind of reporting, I've, I've really seen three different ways to look at this whole issue. And the first is the complete lunatic version of what happened, which is that uh, the banks uh, were somehow pressured into lending to unworthy borrowers uh, because of the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977. Somehow that magically, that problem magically didn't manifest itself until 2008. Uh, and, you know, it didn't matter. There were no credit derivatives throughout that entire time period during the early 80s. But um, that's the crazy version. The part that where people get tripped up on is this sort of me medium version. Because, you know, if you look at it from an objective point of view, if you're some unemployed meth addict, you know, living in, in, you know, suburban Phoenix, you probably shouldn't be taking out a million dollar mortgage, you know? I mean, if you don't have any money and you're just sitting getting high in your house all day long, that's, you know, not responsible and probably ultimately not good for society if there are lots and lots of people who are doing taking that. Taking the mortgage isn't responsible or <laughs> sitting at home and doing that and not working isn't responsible. Probably both. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, though, they, they made these, the, all that credit available to people, and they did it with their eyes wide open. And this was sort of a conscious policy uh, that Wall Street had for years and years and years. They sort of borrowed into existence this gigantic mountain of money, and they were just kind of trying to roll it forward for a little while and shave little bits of it off, from, you know, uh, step by step. And in the end, it turns out that they asked us to buy it uh, through the bailouts, you know, when, when it all blew up in their faces. Um, so this was, this was really something that was, uh, you know, sort of a massive corruption at the very highest levels. And at the individual level, sure, a lot of the, stu a lot of the things that people did were not smart. But it's, uh, you know, if somebody's offering you a million dollar house for nothing, how many people are not going to take that offer? Uh, and, uh, th you know, I think people would have always behaved that way had... Um, you know, had that been available in the 40s or 50s and 60s. What changed in the earlier part of this decade is that suddenly all this new credit was available and there were these new innovations that made this possible. And uh, that was solely Wall Street's responsibility and that had nothing to do with ordinary people. Well, Dan, you call it dumb money. Take us through sort of the phase that we've been, the, 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 the arc of this. How, how do we get this dumb money? Sure. Well, you know, after I kind of date it uh, to after 9-11, Greenspan took rates down, Bush told us to go shopping. Um, we entered this period of cheap money, right? Well, because interest rates came down, and uh, Greenspan took them to the emergency rate of, I believe, one percent, left them there for a while, and then we started getting these justifications as to why this made sense. Because if you told a central banker that you're going to take rates to one percent and hold them there, that will unleash inflation and a speculative bubble, and we started getting people like Bernanke telling us, you know, the reason that interest rates can be so low without inflation is it's not that we're borrowing so much, it's that all the Chinese, they're saving too much. There's a savings glut. They don't, have, they don't like to spend their money, they're concerned. We are just soaking up their savings by issuing debt and doing the world a favor because we always pay back our debt and provide them with a safe place to put it. Um, Bernanke also talked in 2002, 2003 that you know, central bankers are supposed to worry about inflation when you keep interest rates low. You have run the risk of inflation. He said the greatest risk facing us now is not inflation, it's deflation. We had that bubble that popped and things were going poorly and all this excess labor. So the biggest risk was deflation, um, so we shouldn't worry about inflation. Another reason. So we got these kind of ex post facto justifications as to why it made all the sense in the world for short-term rates to be 1% and long-term rates to be 5%. We have this period of cheap money. And then you get a few years where housing is doing well and it's creating a lot of jobs and you know, 
growing up eight or nine percent, and we people get what I call pro forma disease, which is a in business they do pro forma projections, which is you know the last five years look like this, therefore the next five years are going to look like this, and you start extrapolating into the future, um, and you make decisions based on that. So you can you can borrow a hundred percent on a house because three years from now you'll be able to sell it for forty percent more because trees grow to the sky as we all know they just keep <laughs> they going up into space. Um, and so we tip over in 2003, 2004 to this from sort of cheap money to an era of dumb money. Greenspan is raising rates, but mortgages are still going and, and credit is, is doing very well. And then this goes on for another couple of years and it tips uh, over into an era I call the era of dumber money, where people start trading this debt for the sake of trading debt using the debt. So they took the mortgages, they chopped them up, they traded them as bonds. Uh, hedge funds borrow money and trade them. Then they take the bonds and put them into collateralized debt obligations and chop them up further. And then people use debt to trade those. It was, it was debt layered with debt, frosted with debt, iced with debt with, you know, happy birthday written in debt, fine frosting on top of it. Um, and so you get from debt being something that is used to buy a house or buy a business to something that is created for its own sake to trade using debt itself. Um, and we, it devolved into this sort of orgy of debt creation. When you look at the numbers of the amount of subprime bond issuance and CDO, you know, these numbers, they go like this, and then it goes like this. And it wasn't just in housing, it was corporate credit, money used for leveraged buyouts. These gigantic you know, buyouts done, again, with no money down. Every analogy you saw with housing, you saw in corporate credit. Um, these crazy mortgage innovations, you know, the ninja loans, no, in no income, no job, no asset, no problem. Um, so, and this is a, a stage we've seen with different types of bubbles in areas, you know, the telegraph, telephone, um, railroads, the internet in the 90s. It goes through these exact same cycles and it always ends the same way, except when it's a debt-based bubble rather than a stock-based bubble, it the fallout is always much larger. Now, it's one thing, and we can debate further and discuss the propriety of taking advantage of a bubble. But Nomi, you go further than that. You, you see these bubbles as being engineered by these big Wall Street right. firms. They build the bubble? Tell us. Well, you know, going on from, from what Dan was saying, the, the way that debt happens, um, what, what's going on is, let's say we have a, a few subprimes. <coughs> And, and, and imagine sort of a, an upside down triangle, right? And there's some, some subprime loans here on top of, uh, you know, below this, this, this triangle that builds. And then what, what, what banks do is they say, how do we actually make money out of those subprime loans? You know, even the guy with the meth problem's got to pay, you know, a, a mortgage payment sometime. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that mortgage payment and give it to someone else in some sort of a package, and they're going to make money from that. And when I do that as a bank, I make money. I make it from that side, I make it from this side. That's just the bottom level. And then I go again and I say, you know what, I've got a bunch of math addicts, or, you know, no disrespect to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 no I disrespect at, to Matt is not a math addict as far as... I don't mean to say math addicts. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and, and then you do this again, and, and, and you make money, and you package not just, just one loan, you take a million loans. And then you, you take the packages that you made out of those million loans, and you create more and more and more. And so what you have is maybe, and for real, $1.4 trillion is the number of, of real subprime loans in the entire country. And using that $1.4 trillion of loans, I create a level of a pyramid where I create $14 trillion worth of stuff. Stuff that we now know is toxic acid. It doesn't, you know, whatever all the little letters and all, it, it doesn't matter. What it is is I'm taking something that's sort of real, that has real payments sort of coming in, and I can make money by creating new securities based on that money coming in. So I do $14 trillion worth of those. And then I'm like, all right, well, what else can I do? I want to buy some banks. I want to do some trading. I want to pay some bonuses. There's lots of other things I want to do. So I'm going to take that $14 trillion and I'm going to say, here's my $14 trillion worth of stuff based on this $1.4 trillion of subprime loans. Can you loan me another $14 trillion? And can you loan me $14 trillion? And can you loan me $14 trillion? 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 times, depending on the bank taking a sliver of this. So you create more and more and more securities based on this, this, this tiny little amount of subprime loans. I have a chapter in my book called This Was Never About the Little Guy. It was, it was never about the loan. 
If we wanted to fix a financial problem up here, we could have helped people down here. The problem was all the buildup and all the money and all the fees that got made along the way. Every time a security was created, every time it traded, every time it was moved from one pension fund to one city in Iceland, every single time that happened, money was made. And that was the impetus from Wall Street's perspective. It doesn't matter if it's subprime loans or if it's like receipts from the pizza place or if it's movie tickets. It doesn't matter what is at the bottom of that pyramid. It was just convenient that there was this myth that home prices would always go up and it was easy to sell this myth to people. And yeah, it's, it's good to get a million dollars for nothing. And this kind of perforated this whole, this whole pyramid. So at the end of the day, when that all fell apart, all the money had been made along the way. There was no relationship between a security up here and some guy in Stockton, California, down here who was kicked out of his home. No relationship, no responsibility, no nothing. But all of the money had been made along the way, and all of the fees and all of the trading and all the bonuses were paid out before that home ever got foreclosed upon. Um, and so it is manufactured. If I can find any way to create the bottom of my pyramid, if I don't have a bottom, I can't create a pyramid. So I have to go and find the bottom. And that's why I do think it was engineered. We needed to find, in banking, a bottom. And the bottom happened to have been mortgage loans because it was convenient. We were, yes, yes, we were after a bubble. We were after Enron and WorldCom. All this stuff had fallen apart. Recession was happening. The market had gone from being a dot-com bubble to being basically not, you know, dead on arrival. You needed something else to stuff into this pyramid and to make money out of it. It just happened to be convenient to sell the story of, of, of these types of loans. And that's why it was pushed from the top. It was never about lenders lending and dealing with the relationship of people at the bottom. It was, it was pushed from the top. How do we fill this? All right, we'll start here. And that's how really it manifested itself throughout the whole And system. the stuff toward the middle and the top of this pyramid, as you describe it, Matt, is pretty abstruse and unreal. And it doesn't seem to trouble people uh, who were, were in that business. The idea that there's no they're there when you well, get to it, the top. It doesn't matter to them because the, the, no matter whether any of that stuff is imaginary, any of those levels of the pyramid are fictitious or imaginary. It doesn't matter because the money they're making uh, throughout this process is real. And it turns into real beach houses in the Hamptons <laughs> and real Maybachs in your garage and you know real villas in the south of France. Maybach is a really cool car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that stuff is all real. So, the, you know, it doesn't matter if the pyramid is imaginary. And, you know, what's important to understand is that they, they, they needed constantly to find, to find a way to, put, to, to fill stuff, uh, to get stuff to fill that bottom level of the pyramid. So they were constantly sort of inviting people into the game. Uh, I had one guy who, who, who great, uh, gave me a great metaphorical example. He said that Wall Street was like Lucy to America's Charlie Brown. It was like constantly holding the football. He's like, you know, come on, kick it. This is the internet bubble, or this is housing, or this is, this is the oil commodities bubble. They were constantly inviting people in into the game. And once they, once they came in, they found a way to make money out of it and found a way to inflate this bubble out of that asset, however real or unreal it happened to be. Another thing that's important to remember that, you know, like Nomi was talking about, is that these innovations uh, that they created, and in the old days, why, why didn't banks lend money to unemployed meth addicts? Because in the old days, no bank in the world is going to want to sit there and hold that loan, because eventually it's going to blow up in their faces, and they're going to end up, and they're going to end up eating that, that loss. Well, these innovations, uh, you know, particularly collateralized debt obligations and, that, and, and these derivative products, allow these banks to take these big pools of mortgages, basically put them in a box, chop them up, and sell them as securities off in a secondary market to other investors. So now you could lend out that mortgage, uh, you know, to, to your unemployed meth addict, and then you could sell that mortgage immediately <laughs> off to somebody else. So now you're making money coming and going, and you're not taking the risk. So basically, they looked out at America, and they just saw each person who was sitting out there, every warm body that didn't have a mortgage, as just a big pile of money waiting to be seized. All they had to do was get them into the system, put them into the hamburger mill, grind it around for a little while, and sell it off to some trade union in, in Holland or, or you know, CalPERS uh, or some other unsuspecting sucker who's going to end up holding this stuff. And because of the corruption at the ratings agencies and some other problems, uh, they made you know, these terrible subprime loans were somehow magically converted using the, you know, fairy dust into AAA investments. Uh, and, and, you know, they were able in this manner to, to take these terrible, uh, risky things and sell them off to other people, and that was how they pulled that off. Dan, what do you think? You know, 30 years of 
these geniuses graduating from business schools and, and sometimes in advanced physics going into Wall Street, creating financial innovation, they called it. Is it all, was it all worthless? Did it not? I think of, for instance, the railroads. There was a huge bubble of investment that paid to build the railroads across America. Those investors just got destroyed when the bubble popped. We ended up with a pretty cool set of railroad David, are you, are you by chance referring to chapter four of my 2007 book, Pop, Why Bubbles Are Great for the Economy? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we call that a segue, my friend. Should of you to notice. Um, well, we have had this cycle where, you know, absurdly, bubbles are the way we build new infrastructure in this country. Uh, in Europe, when they got the telegraph, when they got the railroad, when they got the internet, the government gets involved and kind of strings the line and builds a network slowly. In America, the government provides incentives for people to go out, and we build way too much. Everybody rounds up capital from their friends and neighbors, and instead of having one telegraph line from New York to Boston, we have three. Instead of having one transcontinental railroad, we had six. Um, people, you know, a, a good idea in America gets funded 10, 15, 20 times. Uh, you get excess capacity, you get a crash, but then you're left behind with something that other people can use. And that's, that's when bubbles are good is when they leave behind a new type of commercial infrastructure that people can use very quickly. So we had this, you know, wreckage of Web 1.0 on which Google and all these other things were able to, to gain scale and build business models that are useful to people quite rapidly. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case here. But when you talk about the I think the, the big mistake or error or flaw was that you know, securitization and derivatives, these are actually very useful innovations and can be. Um, Mexico is a big oil producer. Um, they were able to recently, you know, the price of oil went way up. Uh, they hedge their production so that you know, they're going to get $100 a barrel regardless of their production, you know, no matter what the actual market price is. You know, for Mexico, which gets you know, a huge chunk of its government revenues from selling oil, that insulated them from the fact that oil went down to 60 or 70. There are, there are all sorts of good uses um, that you could point to that people do use derivatives and securitization for. What was forgotten is that these are tools. They are not businesses unto themselves. And I think what happened with things like credit default swaps uh, which killed AIG was you know, credit default swaps are sort of insurance on debt going bad. You can see why you might want to buy. You know, I've lent you money, and I want to can buy insurance from a third party in case you default. But then they turned these things into securities that could be traded and traded with leverage. So the tool becomes this business in its own right. In the same way that, that mortgage-backed securities, we weren't they weren't content just to take a pool of mortgages giving them to Fannie Mae and chop them up to spread risk a little. Those then had to be traded using huge amounts of debt. So the, I think where it went wrong was taking these things that were tools and basically, in many instances, betting the future of these gigantic corporations almost entirely on trading these in, in a new way. Want to move on? You may disagree. Well, you, also, you know, Matt, you wrote that great piece about AIG, in which the term "credit default swap" was all through that thing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, AIG was kind of a disaster waiting to happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the things that's really important to point out about AIG was um, the regulatory failure. I mean, this was really kind of a, a perfect example of how the system doesn't work at all. AIG. Uh, way back in 1999 was basically allowed to choose its own regulator. They, um, there was sort of a loophole in the rules that said that if, you, um, if a holding company owned a thrift, which is basically a savings and loan, uh, in any state in the country, they were allowed to designate the entire bank, holding, uh, entire holding company as a thrift and be regulated by the Office of Thrift Supervision, which is the smallest and weakest regulator basically that we have in Washington. So the OTS ended up being AIG's primary regulator uh, and they only had one insurance expert on their staff uh, during this entire period. And of course, AIG is one of the what, it's one of the world's <coughs> largest companies. I think it was the 18th largest company in the world at the time. It had over almost you know, 160,000 people working for it, and there was literally only one insurance expert that was supposed to be regulating this entire company. Um, but AIG got in trouble for a variety of reasons. One of the things that they were doing is that they had a stock lending business, 
Um, you know, when you lend out securities for any, for, you know, to short sellers or to anybody else, this used to be a very, very safe business. Basically, you know, a company like AIG, which had a lot of subsidiary life insurance companies, they held a lot of securities. They would lend out these securities to short sellers, and you're supposed to take the money you get from that, the collateral that people pay you to, to um, uh, you know, borrow securities, and usually you dump that into something that's absolutely safe, like treasury bills, uh, something that is not going to blow up in your face. Well, AIG took all this money that they were getting from stock lending, and they invested it in mortgage-backed securities, uh, a lot of which were subprime. Uh, and, and of course, that was an incredibly risky investment. So now you're putting, basically, you're putting uh, in jeopardy the life insurance and policies and the nest eggs of tens of thousands of people all over the country. All these people who were buying insurance policies and thinking that they were safe were, you know, actually the management of AIG was gambling this stuff on the housing market at the time. The other thing that they were doing, obviously, was credit default swaps. They were selling credit, insurance, uh, credit default insurance to people who, uh, banks on Wall Street. Um, one of the, the loopholes in the rules about credit default swaps is you don't actually have to have the money that you uh, are supposed to, uh, you know, if you make a promise that you're going to pay out uh, an insurance policy to, you know, someone who buys a credit default swap, you don't actually have to have that money. You don't have to, um, you know, be able to cover that bet. So AIG uh, was basically liable for $440 billion worth of credit default swaps, and they didn't have that money. So when all these bets started going sour, Obviously, uh, you know, the, the roof caved in, and that's why, and, you know, the, again, there were no regulators paying attention in, in, to this problem. If they had been, maybe this could have been averted, but there were, there were myriad problems. Now, the at the beginning of Matt's answer, he started in on a subject, and I'm going to read mine. You're like, oh, my goodness, do we have to talk about that? It's a little abstruse. He talked about regulator shopping. It's actually something we do have to pay a lot of attention to as we turn our conversation to the remedy for all this mess. The notion of who's going to watch over all this. If there's a lot of them, is it possible that some will be lenient, some will be underfunded, and that the, regu the, the regulated companies will try to find the regulator that will treat them the most leniently? So let's switch over to that topic. Nomi, let's talk about that. Uh, we spent, some people think, well, we spent $700 billion to fix the system. That's a lot of money. I think we could have used that money for. Number's a little higher, isn't it? Yeah, the number is a little bit more like seventeen and a half trillion dollars. With a T. With a T. It's 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 very big, and 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 that's because um, there was so much money when 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 this pyramid fell, when the when the credit default swaps, when all these esoteric securities blew up. The, the, the idea that the whole entire financial world and life as we know it would cease to exist was, was so um, thrown out into the, the powers that be at Washington that it was just this fear. The fear created TARP, which was a tiny little $700 billion program, which was 4% of really what came about afterwards. And just, I just want to underscore just, just how screwed up this is. All of the stuff that, that, that Dan and Matt are talking about, the, using insurance, going to an insurance company, they do plain vanilla insurance. They, they deal with your policies. And you try actually getting them to pay you out when you have a car accident or you have a health insurance problem or you have something that goes wrong on your house. You're going to get a bunch of people on the phone and not real people and, and numbers that go nowhere and hang up calls. Whereas when AIG, for example, couldn't pay out on the money they never had, um, when, when different sorts of credit problems were going on to various banks who chose to let AIG be their uh, backer of credit problems, like Goldman Sachs, it was okay because the government stepped in and, and paid a lot of money. TARP was supposed to fix the banks. It was supposed to be like, the banks don't have enough capital. Oh my God, why? It must be because the guy in like, the meth addict like, didn't pay out on his mortgage. But we know that's not the case. Um, Henry Paulson, the former Treasury Secretary, said this was just a housing correction um, going into this idea of TARP. He actually said that the government should not be responsible for helping people who have basically overspent on what they could have, could have done or who have over, over debt or who have made mistakes. It is not the government's job to help people who have made mistakes and speculated. But it was the government's job, as he later showed us, to pay out on all the banks that speculated and the AIGs that speculated. And it wasn't just the Treasury Department, which was part of where TARP came from. The Federal Reserve basically made so many loans available to the banking system because they are all screwed up on this whole big pyramid. 
You know, TARP was a little part. All of this other stuff was coming down on the banking system. They wouldn't lend to each other. Nobody was good for anything. Everything seized up. So the government and the Fed in particular said, okay, well, you know what, here's some money. Here's a trillion dollars in this particular, they call them facilities. It was like a new word that popped onto the Fed books. And then they started making up all these like acronyms for them, like TAF and TALF. And all these things that were so boring even for journalists to really like dig through and understand. And, they're, and they're, the ways in which this money kept pouring out just continued to increase. And, 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 and we started to basically as a country own a lot, of these, a lot of this pyramid that nobody else wanted. Wall Street couldn't trade it with each other. So the Fed took it on. The Fed said, you know what? That thing on line 47 of that big pyramid, you know, we'll take that and we'll give you money at zero percent. We'll give you money at a quarter of a percent. Like how many people in here have ever got a loan for anything at a quarter of a percent? <laughs> But, but, but that was the mentality that was going on with the Fed. And it was the idea of bailing this pyramid, this system, this, this banking situation. TARP was kind of like the open door. That $700 billion was sort of like, all right, we have a catastrophe. We need to fix it. But the facilities that came from the Fed, the fact that the FDIC, which is one of the true agencies in Washington that's supposed to protect our deposits that are like lying inside, like real money, like real stuff we put in that's in these banks was, was having problems paying out because banks were, were falling apart and were going bankrupt and the FDIC was just ill-prepared. So money was borrowed for that from the Treasury. The Fed was borrowing money from the future and printing money from the future. And all this together became $17.5 trillion worth of not just bailout, of subsidies, of cheap loans, of we'll guarantee your crappy stuff from Bear Stearns, J.P. Morgan, just it's okay, take over the company and grow bigger. Um, and, and all of these things that were going on that, that led to a, an exceptional, a historically unprecedented amount of the government shouldering the, the fallen banking system and not even demanding in return for that absolutely any change whatsoever at all. They're still talking about changes and regulations and I know we'll get to that specifically. But, but, but with all of that, with that kind of a price tag, a price tag that is higher than if you actually accumulate every single war, and this country has fought a lot of wars since the revolution, um, through Iraq, through Afghanistan, basically accumulate all of them together. It doesn't even get to 40% of the money that was spent on this one bailout and subsidy of this industry right now for the fact that they went and created a pyramid on the back of nothing. Um, and, and that's really what we're dealing with. It's the philosophy that drove it. It's the sheer numbers. Um, and it's, it's really depressing to actually break them down and see how many little programs were built and many press releases, but we're not really going to show you. The Fed to this day will not reveal how many bad assets they have in return for those 25, uh, a quarter of a percent loans. There, there's still this idea that somehow the public knew that. Ben Bernanke, who is the head of, of the Fed, says that would be counterproductive. It's perfectly productive to pay trillions of dollars to keep this system afloat. It's unproductive, apparently, to let us know how it is that's actually being done. Dan, there's a presumption that some of these companies will pay this back and that we could actually make some money off of some of this. There's, some of the banks have returned some of the money, and it was a pretty decent return. Um, what's your sense? Is, it, is this good for the taxpayer? It's all in the structure of, 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 of what we've asked them Nothing to do. Nothing about this is good for the taxpayer. Um, some of this was sold. I, I remember I interviewed uh, Henry Paulson in the midst of this about a year ago. I did a cover story. We had him on the cover as King Henry. And uh, Ben Affleck later came out and, said, and blamed us. That said that we put him on the cover and called him King Henry and that eased the way for him to pass all that legislation. And, I, you know... I liked ben Good, Affleck? I liked Goodwill Hunting. Um, and so I was, I was very hurt. And you know, that was sort of like blaming Jill Yee for the whole destruction of Hollywood's models. <laughs> but he did come out and say, uh, when we were putting money into AIG, and was sort of proud of himself by saying, we're going to give them $80 billion of credit, but we're going to charge them like a 10% interest rate. You know, we're really going to... Exactly. And he was like being the investment banker in chief. And of course, he was selling that as an, invest, an investment and, you know, that we're going to get this really high rate of return. We're going to get zero on that. Uh, when the TARP was passed, the centerpiece of it was this capital purchase program, basically taking shares, preferred shares in all these big banks for which they're supposed to pay 5% interest. Um, and then they would give us these warrants that we either have to buy back or the government gets to sell. And so about $200 billion has gone out in that. About 70 billion of that principal has been paid back with interest, and we've gotten some 
of these warrants. Those are the healthy banks, the J.P. Morgans that have two hundred and seventy healthy- out. Yeah, and plus you know interest payments, and so we've made. So if you look at each of those transactions, yeah. lent twenty billion to J.P. Morgan. They paid that back with the interest. We got these warrants. You could say that's a return to the taxpayers. Now, of course, we had to borrow that money in the first place. So the the returns in the end are marginal. Uh, there were other investments we could have made with that money. Um, and meanwhile, there are other subsidies that banks are getting. We're, we're backing their issuance of debt. Interest rates are at zero, which you know, will have a cost to us down the road. Um, I do think the final cost, the budgetary cost, is for some of these programs is going to be less than we think. Uh, so the TARP was authorized at $700 billion. They used the TARP to make loans to GM and Chrysler, which we ain't getting back. They used a chunk of it to make loans to AIG, which we're not getting back. A big, very big chunk of, those, of that capital purchase program will come back, uh, but thus far they haven't been taking the money and returning it to the Treasury. They're kind of holding it in reserve for future things. Uh, some of the big liabilities we exposed ourselves to, the government a year ago came and said, we're going to guarantee the whole money market fund industry, which is where Americans keep their cash, $3.8 trillion. Uh, that has since been lifted. So we're no longer formally guaranteeing it. But, you know, a year or two from now, if something bad goes happens, we know we will step in again. So s- some of these things we have done, um, or they have done, have sort of worked in stabilizing, just sort of putting that guarantee there stabilize those particular sectors. Commercial paper, a very boring sector of the market where companies borrow for 30 to 90 days, stopped working after Lehman. The Fed came in and said, we'll guarantee this. Companies issued 350 billion. Things started to return to normal. They issued debt in the normal market, so now we're only guaranteeing 40 billion. So some of these things are gonna subside and go away. Some of this money is gonna come back. Um, The end, net budgetary cost is going to be maybe smaller than was anticipated. At the same time, we've been getting into other areas like housing more deeply. Federal Housing Authority is now one of the biggest lenders and it's going to have all sorts of problems. So on the one hand, there may be some hyperbole to some of these numbers as as the real cost. Um, On the other side, this notion that these were investments. Investment is something you want to make. This is not an investment anybody wanted to make. Well, if I could, yeah. But but also a lot of even what has been paid back, which is a very 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 small sliver of the entire amount that's been put out, and um, is coming from other pools of money. So it's like I can borrow money from the Fed at nothing and pay back the TARP at whatever, and then the Wall Street Journal not to, or, or, or some paper will say, okay, we're getting four percent return or eight percent return or whatever on the TARP. You know, and and, and, and and that's not that's not real money. If I if I go to Vegas and I lose a bet, and I basically like put down my hundred and it goes away, and then I borrow it from Dan, and it goes away, and I borrow it from Matt, and it goes away, and I finally, you know, go over to David and got a hundred bucks, and I go back to you know the table and say, here's an extra twenty, and I like play again. Um, yeah, the twenty is real at that point, but but not really. Um, and, and, and that's why we're still we're we're still really deep into this cycle, and and we still own as a country. Um, sort of on these books of the Fed at the Treasury, back through, back and through the FDIC, assets that we have no idea how to value because they don't actually have. Well, we we could mathematically value them. I did that for a living, but but there's no value if nobody wants them. But yet there they are sitting. There's just been this massive transference. It's like we're waiting for the other shoe to drop, um, and, and it and it will. Matt, uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bernanke, his. <coughs> Statements and body language are, well, you know what, though? It's kind of working. Things are better now than they were. Look at the Dow, you know, is, is the implication. Uh, is it working? Things, people don't seem to be quite as petrified as they were six months ago. Is that a justification for what how, our response to the crisis? Well, I mean, I think you have to add, it depends on who you're asking the question, is it working? I think if you ask Lloyd Blankfein, is it working, he's going to say, yeah, it rocks, you know. I mean, we, we, you know ask a banker, it's A-OK. Right, I mean, yeah, like a year ago, I was going to have to sell my beach house in order to, you know, be, be meet, meet my mortgage payment or whatever. Now now they're, they're rolling in money again. 
but you know the, the the real test is what's happened to ordinary people, and they you know they keep talking about a recovery, they keep talking about how the Dow is going up, but they, we keep hearing these statistics that there you know there aren't new, uh, enough jobs being created, um, and we keep hearing that ordinary people aren't aren't doing as well, and this is this is the real test. I mean, ultimately, this bailout. Uh, they want us to look at it in a vacuum, like, look, these companies were hurting, and we had to help them uh, because if we, we didn't help them, it was going to pose a systemic risk. But the reality is all of the decisions we made during the bailout were political decisions about who gets what. Every time we give money to one set of people, we're taking money away from another set of people. If we give a mountain of cheap money to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, uh, and then we're all paying market rates when we have to borrow money. Well, that's money that actually came out of our pocket ultimately. That's not money that just came out of nowhere and ended up in the, in the, you know, in the bottom lines of these banks. That's money that came from us. Uh, so this ultimately, I think the bailout was really, it was a political decision to use the power of the state to take money from one set of people, uh, the rest of us, and shift it back to, this, to, the, to the very people who got us into the mess in the first place. So when they say that it's working, it's working in the sense that it's, it's perpetuating the system that got us into the, in the mess in the, in the first place, but it's also not working on another, on another level that's much more important to the rest of us. And it was a pillage. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Katrina mentioned we have a, in her words, a reformist president. And in any cataclysm, it is an opportunity. It could be a revolutionary time where people have kvetched, as my grandma would say, for years about uh, Wall Street. But after this collapse and the position that the country was placed in, it's time for change. Our, we'll start with Nomi. Are we seeing revolutionary change as a response to the crisis now that there's a new administration in power? No. Um, there have been many congressional hearings and, and many speeches from Obama and from Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner as to the need to, to regulate, the need to um, not let uh, Wall Street go back to the reckless practices, I think, um, as, as Obama called them, that, that they got us into this mess. And, and yet, in the same time, when he, he said the speech that, that talked about the reckless practices of Wall Street, um, also thought that it would be good if they would realize that the public had given them money and sort of, you know, bow and say thank you and sort of be all respectful and socialistic. Um, but, but, you know, that, that it's not going to happen voluntarily. Um, so a lot of the regulations that are being discussed right now um, are like raising the capital requirements at these banks. That sounds like a good thing. We have <laughs> banks. They don't have enough money to pay their own losses. They came to the government for money. Government gave it. So how about they just save some more money so next time the government doesn't have to? That sounds great on the surface. But beneath the surface, banks are bigger and more powerful than they were before the crisis. Washington, in particular, Fed, has allowed these banks to become bigger. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, Wachovia. You've seen the statistic on the concentration of wealth in America now. It's now with just a few companies. Exactly. A good piece of it. Uh, the, the, the top the top banks used to, the top five banks used to control 25 percent of, of, of deposits and now they're closer to a 48 percent there's 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 a tremendous concentration and what that means is they get to call those deposits capital they get to call our money in their bank capital so when the government says let's raise capital requirements that sounds good but as long as these banks are big and allowed to get bigger they get to use us for capital. And when our deposits are in there, we are not getting really good interest rates on our savings accounts. And we are getting slapped with stupid fees on checking accounts. And we all of a sudden get these like, you know, arbitrary other numbers uh, come in because that's, that's capital. Our money is real money. Our fees are real, real money. They're not, they're not the pyramid. They're, they're, they're actually coming out of our pocket. So, so those kind of reforms sound good but don't necessarily do anything. It sounds good to have derivatives all regulated. All these little side bets should be out in the open. And, and that's absolutely true. But at the same time, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley uh, and Bank of America and one other own 96% of the exchanges that, that trade credit derivatives. Um, they are actually 
part owner conflict of interest type ships in where this stuff trades. So really what you're doing by regulating everything on the same exchanges is giving them even more information um, to basically do all sorts of exchange arbitrage or just you know, trading sort of amongst themselves or, or other things that can come up. And all of that is because the reforms that are being discussed are little cosmetic changes that look good and sound good. But bottom line, banks are too big. Financial institutions are too convoluted. They are too difficult to regulate. And because they are so difficult, they continue to take a lot of risk. Now they are doing it on the back of government capital, which is our public money and our future money. And they will try to do it on the back of our deposits and our life insurance policies and our health insurance package and whatever it might be because what we pay is real. And so unless you actually make banks smaller and dissect them into institutions that cannot speculate here with our money there and call it capital, we're going to continue to go down this very risky road. And when these institutions get large, among the deep concerns is that we could never in good conscience allow them to fail. And that's a big discussion they're having, right, Dan and Washington, which is the really big firms, if we let them go the way of AIG, we would all suffer. But the thing is, those big firms know when they reach that stage, and it encourages them to take risk. Right, so the challenge is now, you know, what happens after you have a bubble is consolidation. It's, it's not surprising that J.P. Morgan Chase uh, now has some huge chunk of, of deposits in this country because they were, you know, better managed than all the ones that failed, and they've been able to pick up the pieces with the help of the government. And so now you have the issue of basically having to try to shrink them or to put the incentives in place that would make it uh, worthwhile for the banks to shrink themselves. I think the great problem we've had with our regulation and with our Federal Reserve and with our system at large is that it's pro-cyclical. And by that I mean when something gets going, all the people who want to do more of the same do more of it. They get all the rewards, they get all the salaries, they get the promotions, so they keep doing it. And the regulators don't, there's nothing in there to tell them you shouldn't be doing this. We need to be more counter-cyclical, which is to have, if, if we can't trust the human beings to control themselves from running across a cliff, put guardrails the cliff so that when they try to run over, they bump into it and, and, and fall back. And, you know, some of the things that people are talking about, and I'm, I'm not particularly confident that they'll pass, is, you know, the FDIC desure, ensures deposits. This is one of the problems. And we went, you know, there was this, I did a piece on this in 2006, the streak of something like 960 days without a bank failure. Because, of, you know, the conditions were very good for banks in 04, 05, 06. And what that meant was that the um, government stopped collecting deposit insurance premiums because the, the fund was here and they hadn't made any payouts in three years. So they said, you don't have to pay anymore. Which is like if you live on the coast of, of Florida, and there hasn't been a hurricane for three years, everybody stops paying their hurricane insurance premiums. You know, nobody, nobody does that. Um, the reality is that it should work the opposite. If there haven't been any bank failures for three to four years and deposits are growing, that's the time to start collecting more deposits. Uh, they level the fees based on your riskiness. If you're in, in better shape, you pay a lower uh, fee for, to insure your premiums. But if you are so big, like Citigroup, that your failure could swamp the entire system, they need to put an incentive to, that maybe it doesn't make quite as much sense for you to have deposits that are this big. So the, if the insurance premiums were based not only on riskiness, but on size, that if you want to insure $100 billion in deposits versus five, you pay a higher uh, you know, percentage fee for doing this. These are... Um, you know, if we could, those are some of the things that I think need to be done because you can't rely on the CEOs to say, gee, should we do this one extra deal or should we not do it? You know, should we do this acquisition or not? Should, you always want to get bigger and you can't rely on the. Well, your shareholders will demand that you get bigger. And you can't rely on the Federal Reserve to say, uh, yeah, the stock prices are too high, we better do something about this. No one wants to be the buzzkill. Um, so we need to build in some buzz kills. So the question becomes, will we build those bulwarks? Um, you know, I used to think, covering all these stories that we do about all the things that we cover on the show, I used to think the meta issue, the issue that was above all other issues and everything could be traced to, was education, if you just educate people better. 
a lot of these problems will go away. I don't think so. I think the meta issue is campaign finance reform. These Wall Street firms have a major role in our political system, and when those large moneyed interests have concerns about legislation, they have friends who have to listen to them. I mean, you wrote all this that piece about Goldman Sachs. It's hard to separate Goldman Sachs, the powerful bank, from Goldman Sachs' <coughs> alumni doing their work in the government itself. What do you think, Matt? Right, and they, they've, they've basically created a, a situation now where the, the government is, is really just a tool of the, the major financial companies and they, and they use the government to privatize their, their risk, uh, and they, I'm sorry, to, pri to socialize their risk and they privatize their profits. And we always talk about that in sort of a general sense, but they've actually managed after the, the post-bailout period to sort of formalize this arrangement. Um, you know, I have a great example of this is uh, the Bear Stearns bailout. Um, uh, how did, what, what got Bear in trouble? Bear, uh, one of the things that was happening was uh, Bear was doing, uh, buying a lot of uh, subprime mortgages from a company called Countrywide. Everyone remember this company? Uh, country, Countrywide was sort of basically a criminal enterprise that was that was uh, lending out a gazillion, you know, toxic mortgages to a bunch of again unemployed meth addicts. Uh, they sold those off to Bear Stearns, and that was one of the things that that got Bear in a lot of trouble. So when Bear starts to fail, what happens? Um, suddenly, Bear needs to find a buyer. Uh, they go to the government. Uh, they tell them we're in trouble. We need help to find a buyer. Um, the Federal Reserve and the government sits down with the Bear executives and they, they find J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan Chase says, look, there's all this garbage uh, on Bear's books. A lot of it is this countrywide stuff. Uh, so we're happy to take Bear off your hands, but we want the government to buy all this garbage. So they created this facility called Maiden Lane 1, which was solely intended to buy up all this garbage. Uh, Timothy Geithner, who was the head of the New York Federal Reserve at the time, uh, put a company called BlackRock in charge of managing Maiden Lane, this facility in the, in the Federal Reserve. It's worth pointing out that Timothy Geithner used to work for a thing called the P. Peterson Foundation. Uh, P. Peterson is also uh, one of the founders of this company, BlackRock, so there's that relationship already. Maiden Lane basically uh, throws $29 billion at this whole process of buying up all these uh, uh, mortgages uh, from, from Countrywide. Uh, and then what happens? BlackRock goes and they create a new company called PennyMac, and who do they hire to run PennyMac? Uh, former Countrywide executives. Uh, so now PennyMac, their job is to go uh, in conjunction with BlackRock. They go in and they cherry pick the mortgages that are still performing because they know the, one, the, the mortgages that are the good mortgages from the bad mortgages. They take the ones that are still performing, they buy them for 20 cents, 25 cents in the dollar from the government, and they leave the crap ones in Maiden Lane for all of us to pay for. And that's basically how the bailout works. It's a sewage system that allows the banks to dump the stuff on all of us while they take the stuff that makes the money. Uh, so they have this formalized arrangement that's empowered them um, uh, basically to use the government as an engine for taking bad assets off their hands while they, make them, uh, they turn the money again into real beach houses and, and profits and, and cash. And that, that's what's happened right now. And again, this summer, when people were preoccupied with the passing of Michael Jackson, or whether or not um, President Obama's birth certificate was in order, uh, the Obama administration came out with this blueprint for how, how we're going to change the financial system. And some of the stuff was interesting about the structure for regulation moving forward. And there was a, a plaintive plea, I think, if I read it right, saying that we should all cooperate internationally so that you know, if you regulate here in this country, the capital won't run off to the Cayman Islands. But didn't, it wasn't revolutionary. It didn't really get at the problems that you describe in your book, Naomi. No, I mean, this idea that they were sweeping reforms. You know, you think sweep, you think, you know, kind of clean it out and sort of start better or something. And, 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 it, and it wasn't that. The, the, the thing that it, it truly missed um, was creating banks that, that couldn't, and, and insurance companies and, and, and other financial firms that cannot screw around with other people's money. It, it, was, it was the idea of, say, Glass-Steagall, which was a 1933 act that was passed in a Depression era by FDR, a Democratic president, by a Republican Treasury Secretary, by a bipartisan Congress, turned around at the time. It was, in the, it was, it was after one, one of the bubbles that, that, that Dan talks about, and it was a situation where it's like, look, the banks really screwed us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to really 
kick some bank butt and dissect the risky businesses that they do from the ones that deal with the public. And the government will back the public because that is the government's responsibility because we pay 80% of the tax revenues that go into the government. We get to get the protection. And anything that speculates and anything that takes risk, that is really fine, but you're on your own. If the meth addict goes after he's got his like million dollar mortgage to Vegas and doesn't have the money to make good on what he put down on that table, no one backs him. And, 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 and that, that should have been brought, a sweeping reform would have been a, a way to actually do that. Why? Because in the absence of that, as these banks continue to get bigger and more defined, and, and, and a lot of what Dan makes sense in terms of maybe a, a more of an FDIC insurance, although right now the FDIC is so out of money, they're asking J.P. Morgan to actually front them the money so, so, so FDIC can actually pay interest to J.P. Morgan for money in order to insure J.P. Morgan, which is ridiculous. Um, but, but, but to actually, actually split it up. The idea that J.P. Morgan even owns Bear, where the government actually takes takes bare risk and J.P. Morgan takes our deposits and slaps on stupid fees for, for things that we have no control over changing is, is absolutely ludicrous and unstable. Sweeping firms would have been doing away with that. It wouldn't be, gee, how do we do something about these too big to fail banks? A five-year-old can tell you what to do with things that are too big. You, you make them smaller so that they're not as dangerous. It's, it's, it's not that complicated. Paul Volcker, as a matter of fact, mentioned Glass-Steagall last um, week at a testimony, and it was like blanked by the entire media. Like somehow the White House must have like, after he left, like put him in a room somewhere and just, you know, he wasn't on, he didn't do the rounds after that because he actually brought up something he's been bringing up for a long time, that if things get too big, they will be dangerous. And banks get too big, they are expensive and dangerous. And so sweeping reform would have been to change that and nothing Nothing that came out of that white paper or any of the regulations that have been discussed since that paper um, have, have really changed or will change anything of, of what behaves. In fact, it almost like subsidizes this idea of the practices that already happen, except also there's government capital behind it as well. There's a member of this audience who has the power of clairvoyance, written way before you got to that point. What is the likelihood of restoring Glass-Steagall? separating the uh, utility banks from the investment casino banks. And it, it, remember, uh, they tried to get Glass-Steagall repealed, the Depression-era banking uh, regulation, many, many times. Um, and then finally in the Clinton administration, Thanks, it yeah. finally happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> in part, what it wrought. What, what are the possibilities that they're going to roll back uh, <laughs> I, 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 think it, I think it will take them really suffering, unfortunately, a tremendous loss on the back of what's just been used to subsidize banking. Another the, disaster. The, 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 it, it, the first, it's like it takes 12 pillages. The first one just, just didn't <laughs> seem to work. And, 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 and it's astonishing. They're all scratching their head thinking about, oh, how do we systemically regulate something that we don't even really know how to deal with? It, it, it doesn't even make any sense. The chances are very low. The clairvoyance was even there at the time in 1999 when Glass-Steagall was repealed. There, there were plenty of voices, but they were also kind of shut it aside as well. Byron Dorgan, senator from North Dakota, was like, this is going to cost the taxpayer billions of dollars. He was wrong. It was trillions. <laughs> but but, 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 but you, can, you, can, you can sort of foresee this stuff. And, and it is unlikely it, it will happen. It's obviously zero likely it will happen after this particular uh, epic that we've all just gone through. But, 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 but this will get worse. Right now we still have a whole lot of toxic stuff floating around um, that, that, that still exists. We're just kind of ignoring it. Bank profits are up. The Dow is going to hit 10,000 soon and everything's kind of happy. But all this stuff is still festering at the bottom. Unfortunately, I think it's going to take a, a, another disaster. You, you would think that this one might have done it. Just, just re really quick, one more point about Glass-Steagall. Um, Bob Rubin, who was a sitting Treasury Secretary for Bill Clinton at the time, he was really the driving force behind the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Uh, when Glass-Steagall went through, uh, it, it was a law that was, that was pushed through really so that the Citigroup merger could happen. It allowed Citibank to merge with travelers. and. Um, as soon as it went through, Rubin left office and went to work for Citigroup and made himself about $150 million over the next 10 years. Uh, I, I think maybe if there was a law that said that after you passed 
uh, deregulatory action. You, you couldn't go and make $150 million with that company. That might help us, you know, get to the point of not having this happen again somehow. What you couldn't have is, after Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, be an economic advisory in this particular right. situation. Right, you know? exactly. exactly. Basically, I screwed up then, I'll just come back and... Right, right, I did such a great job. I'll be on yeah. your economic advisory yeah. team now. But it's actually one of the, the retread. Has one of the say. problems that got us here clearly is that um, so many financial companies got involved in banking like activities, and it became unclear like who is the appropriate regulator. But today, uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve was testifying, and he was uh, sounding a little defensive about the power of the Fed to regulate. Um, to be the big regulator. And he sort of backed off, it seemed, a little bit, saying, well, we'll just kind of, we'll, we'll focus on the banks in particular, not some of these other companies. What should we make of that, Dan? And wrote a lot about. And, you know, before I got into journalism, I studied American history in graduate school for a couple of years and read a lot about the Great Depression, which made me a lot of fun at, at the bars. <laughs> um, and the, it seems to me that if anybody should know the lessons from that period in the 20s and the 30s, not just the bubble, but the reform, and how you deal with Wall Street in the aftermath of this. It's Bernanke. Um, where Obama, I think, and, and Bernanke suffer in comparison to FDR is their willingness and tendency and desire to still listen to Wall Street and the banks as if they have any legitimacy. In the early 30s, when you know, all the banks were closed, there was no banking industry and they came up with the FDIC. The American Banking Association opposed it. They thought it was socialistic. And of course, this was the best thing to happen to banks. It stood them in great stead for the next 75 years. When they wanted to uh, pass the Securities and Exchange Commission Act and enforce the New York Stock Exchange to kind of register with the government, um, their president, Richard Whitney, said that well, the exchange is a perfect institution. This was after the Dow had fallen 90%. <laughs> and Whitney, two years later, went to jail for um, committing what I think is the ultimate WASP crime. He embezzled from the gratuities fund for the clerks at the <laughs> NYSE. <laughs> Um, so Wall Street does not, you know, history tells us that the banks will oppose the reforms and regulations that are best for them. It's like, you know, your kid's screaming and crying that he doesn't want to go to the dentist for a checkup. And of course, they get the fluoride treatment so they'll never have cavities again. Um, the principle should be that, that we should have learned from the, that Bernanke should have learned and that I think Obama and his team should be internalizing is that when you screw up something on this scale, especially these guys who have a history of not knowing what regulation works for them. You don't get a voice or much of a voice in the cleanup. Um, when the bankers screamed and yelled, you know, FDR, the great line in his campaign about how I welcome their hatred. These are the most unpopular people in the country. Uh, with Obama, the line is, you know, I'll call Jamie, which means I'll call Jamie Dimon to sort of ask the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. And I think that's a, the sort of source of frustration um, for me and I think for a lot of people generally as this process goes forward the people who burn down the house with the kitchen fire should not have the prime seat at the table when you figure out how you're going to rebuild we're taking one audience question let's take another Noah Rose um, posed this one and, and I it resonates with me as a person who in my reporting assignment spends a lot of time in American homes as people face foreclosure. The housing crisis is at the core of our financial and economic crisis. Um, why do you think the current administration has not addressed this issue sufficiently, while economists, including the conservative uh, Martin Feldstein, have warned about this growing crisis? I mean, there were some big plans, and they're very, very slow to deploy. They made very bad, dumb choices that indicate that, you know, on the one hand, they were, they were listening to what Wall Street banks desperately needed, which was capital, and the other, they were completely not understanding the whole pyramid. If, if someone is foreclosing, if they're not able to pay on their mortgage and they still own a house, what the government could have done with a fraction of the bailout money is, is help to make those mortgages whole and actually have an investment in a home that allows someone to stay in their home rather than an investment somewhere um, in J.P. Morgan Chase while you're backing Bear Stearns' assets within that institution. It chose not to do that. So though 
the housing crisis was at not the core; it was at the bottom of this pyramid. It, it was a 1.4 trillion. No, the subprime loans were, as I mentioned before, 1.4 trillion dollars worth of. Not all of them were failing. All of them could have been made whole for a fraction of the cost. We would have all been like that socialist. You shouldn't let the meth addict get his like house paid for. But it's okay to let everyone who borrowed against that house and the meth addict to get their losses paid for. Um, and so it, it was done completely wrong. And, and, and a lot of that was initiated with, with, with Hank Paulson, and, and I, I think he understood the relationship, but, but chose to, to spin it in a very different way. These people will get credit if we feed into the top pyramid of the banking system. And that, that has not been true. People's credit situations have deteriorated. Foreclosures have increased. Delinquencies have increased. Defaults have increased. Because the problem wasn't fixed at its core. It was sort of dealt with up here where, where, where banks were losing money and not actually dealt with down here, which would have been sensible economically. It would have been cheaper for everyone else. It would have kept people in their homes and it would have stopped the hemorrhaging that has inflated, um, basically deflated the entire system. Um, and it, I, I don't understand why it wasn't done. It, 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 what has happened is not only stupid and expensive and enabling, um, it is criminal. Hey, Matt, here's a cool idea, nice and simple, from one of the people here tonight. Why shouldn't a bank that makes a loan to a customer be prohibited from selling that loan to anyone else? seems to me that lending institutions have, have to, you know, if they held their debts, they'd worry about who the money was going to, and they'd probably uh, keep an eye on things. I, I think there's, there's probably some validity to that idea, but I mean, I, I also agree with Dan that a lot of these instruments that they created, these derivative innovations that allowed people to, to sell these mortgages off to on a secondary market, they, you know, they weren't entirely useless either. They, had, they did have some, some applications where they were useful. I think where we got in trouble uh, with that whole issue with mortgages was the rating agencies and, and, the, way, and the way these assets were, were marked. Um, they used all kinds of crazy mathematical formulas to, to look at, uh, you know, what kind of a risk these mortgages posed. And they, um, they were basically allowed to take these mortgages, shake them up in a box and say, well, if you have, you know, 50 people who are a bad risk, um, well, 25% of the time there, enough of the money is going to come in so that that part of it is going to be a good risk or something like that. I mean, it's just this, this crazy formula that allows you to disguise bad mortgages as good mortgages. Um, if you, I think if you did away with that, if you forced the ratings agencies to be more stringent, to, act, to accurately mark what these, um, what these mortgages were, and if you did away with some of the more ridiculous uh, you know, forms of these innovations like, you know, a great one I love is the CDO squared, which I'm not even going to get into, but basically it's like if you have a whole bunch of uh, triple B rated slices of, of these mortgage backed deals left over uh, and you can't sell them, you can basically throw them in this thing called the CDO squared, shake it up, and magically a, whole, a percentage of them will turn into AAA assets all of a sudden. Uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's complete and total alchemy, but they allow it. I think if you did away with some of that, uh, and force people to actually, um, you know, to accurately mark what the assets were, that would probably address the problem. Here's an interesting one. Can we shrink the financial services industry and get them to do socially useful work? I mean, a, a corollary not written on the card is, is, has it already happened? Has it already happened? I mean, New York is going to suffer greatly because of how that industry has collapsed. New York has depended on taxing a lot of that. So, um, should it be shrunk? Has it already shrunk? What do you think? I'll we'll start with Dan, maybe. Well, I think there's no question it yeah. has shrunk. Um, the number of firms, uh, you know, there's been this devolution. The people who were hedge fund managers have gone back to being kind of analysts, and the people who are analysts have gone back to being accountants, and the people who are accountants uh, are going back to school. I mean, there's, there's been this big contraction. A lot of the firms... You know, it just like X-ray technician is a booming area that you could get a job. <laughs> but just you know, after the dot-com crash, right? A lot of people who were CEOs of dot-com companies went back to being consultants, and a lot of people who were the consultants went back to being programmers. And you know, there's there was a shrinkage, and you're seeing that here. A lot of companies have disappeared. Um, there's a, a group of businesses I call the 40% Club, which is that their business has shrunk by 40%. You know, the market has shrunk by 40%. The volume of 
of trade in some ways, you know, first class airfare, all these sorts of things that were tethered to high finance um, in the aftermath of, of last September shrunk by 40%. So there are fewer firms around, fewer people working for them, more, um, certainly more spots in the parking lot in Westport, Connecticut when I get on the train in the morning because there are fewer people going to their jobs in Stanford and, and in New York. So there, there has been some shrinkage. I, you know, I've been on uh, several of these panels at one of them one of my friends and colleagues, a guy named Jesse Isinger, he used to work for the Wall Street Journal portfolio, he's a great journalist, that he thought this was going to be a, this sort of collapse is a good thing because there was going to be a flowering of the arts now, <laughs> which, you know, I spit out my water. Because uh, the people who are trading mortgage-backed securities are not going to become painters. Um, but, so, you know, but you know what could happen, though? And, and, and sort of, Nomi, you're actually a personification of this, which is, the people who would go in, in the future into that line of work, they're often extremely smart people, and if maybe they were redirected, they could solve big social problems or cure disease or something. Or become journalists. Or become journalists, exactly. <laughs> but but, but that, that, that's very true. There's actually, I used to get a lot of emails from people when I first... But you said something socially useful. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> no, she's changing the world. She's changing. <laughs> that's true. Um, and I don't paint. But the, 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 the most important... Um, sort of change I've seen is that yeah, young, younger people are used to um, <coughs> consider whether they go to Wall Street or not. I get a lot of these emails from should I, should I get an MBA and like make some money or should I you know become a musician and and now I don't really get those anymore. So I think it's that more people are trying to become a musician because if you're if if there are less jobs, you might as well try and do something that you like doing rather than banging your head against the wall trying to get them. That said, it is still um, <coughs> as shrunk as it may be right now. Wall Street has a tremendous Tremendous resilience. It, it has shrunk many, many times. There's been emerging debt crises. There was the, the dot com collapse. There was Enron and, 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 and WorldCom collapsing, taking away a lot of the M and A people who used to put energy companies and telecom companies together. There's there's a lot of collapses, and a lot of people fall out. And then a year or two later, things kind of miraculously come back and people will get rehired. Right now bonuses are up at three out of the six major banks that have um, survived and, and, and merged out of this. Lehman survived to some extent. It, it went bankrupt, but, but a lot of people sort of have transferred over throughout different places and some, some are looking for jobs. But, but So there's, there is a change with people coming in who can actually make the thought, you know, do I need to go to Wall Street or if I'm not going to be able to, can I go do something more socially useful or become a painter or, or, or journalist or something else? Um, but I think that Wall Street um, and the mechanism of banks, mechanism of capitalism, all of that is going to continue to thrive as evidenced by the bounce back profits and the bounce back bonuses um, and the fact there's a lot of new jobs in the sort of different aspects of the hedge fund arena looking at taking some of the cherry picking some of the toxic assets that are still around and seeing if they can be just repackaged for later and kind of thought of as the good ones and, and, and resold and, and reprofited from. So it's, it's kind of, as, as I think maybe, I don't know, you have an opinion on this, but it's almost a cycle as well as sort of a, a debt and bubble cycle. Well, there's kind of a self, you know, the classic example is private equity funds. They call a lot of debt into being because they're going to, you know, I'm going to borrow $50 billion to buy a company. And so debt, they, those loans are made on, at their behest. And then things go badly and those loans which have been sold become distressed. So the same private equity fund forms a new pool of money to buy, you know, to buy distressed debt that it created. So there is a certain amount of self-perpetuation. Distressed debt's big right now. There are jobs in distressed debt. <laughs> now, as a broadcaster, I'm ruthless about time. We have five minutes left, and I'm gonna, we have a last question from the audience here. But what we'll do is I will run it past each of you in turn. But it'll be unfair to the first person who gets the question. I, I'm going to tell a lame financial joke, which will give each of you 30 seconds to think about how you'll frame your answer. So start, th I'll tell you the question, tell my lame joke, and then we'll start, <laughs> starting with Matt. Uh, but here's the question to each of you. If you were one of President Obama's trusted advisors, what advice would you give him on the subject at hand? <coughs> the little Jeopardy music starts playing. Okay. Everybody kept saying how complicated all this stuff was when the meltdown started to happen. And there was all these abstruse things like credit default swaps while people were, you know, selling the company short. And it sounded like gobbledygook. Actually, it's all very simple. A credit default swap, holding one of those as the, you're selling the company short, 
Here's the metaphor. It's exactly like taking out a life insurance policy on your neighbor and then running him over the next day with your rider mower. You can't lose. 28 seconds. All right, you're on. What would you tell Obama? I'd tell him to fire all the people that he put in charge of regulating the the financial services industry. And and replace them with people who never worked on Wall Street or had a distant connection to it. Obama's... And I'll be real quick about this. His biggest mistake when he, when he came into office is he put a Goldman Sachs executive in charge of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates the commodities market. He put a Goldman Sachs executive in the number two position in the Treasury, Mark Patterson, a guy who used to be a lobbyist for Goldman Sachs who lobbied against restrictions on bonuses during, during the bailouts. He filled the entire apparatus uh, of the regulatory mechanism with former Wall Street guys who had already done nothing but screw up for the last 10 years. We gotta get rid of these people and put real people in there. And otherwise it doesn't matter what rules we should be putting. Dan, we're gonna transcribe this and send it to the White House before uh, the clock strokes midnight. What would you tell them? That the basic principle should be sort of a variant of what Colin Powell told Bush was the pottery barn rule, you know, you you break it, you own it. Um, that was about Iraq. Uh, this one is that you created a mess, you should pay for it. And you should pay to insure yourself against future messes because this will happen again. So the, the guiding principle of going forward should be that Wall Street, the banking system, should be forced to pay for you know, as much as possible for what just happened and to create insurance mechanisms um, to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And I'm talking about things like you know, FDIC, we were talking about you know, higher insurance premium for deposits. You, there should be a, you know, a tax on securities trading, derivative trading, tiny tax on every transaction that goes into a pool that will be the sort of bailout fund, the stabilization fund. Um, you know, right now, of course, hedge fund and private equity, uh, their profits are taxed at capital gains rates, not income tax rates. Well, one way to get people to pay a little more. Uh, we barely, uh, badly need uh, tax revenues, increase those rates. So the principle should be looking to the industry um, that is throwing off huge amounts of revenue and will continue to do so and figure out the principle should be that um, the new regulatory structure in place puts the burden of paying for the, to insure themselves and to bail themselves out on the industry itself. Naomi, what would you tell them? Remember why you got elected. (laughs) Now you... You campaigned on change. You campaigned on form. You campaigned on being FDR. You campaigned on having courage and on doing something different. You campaigned on hope. You campaigned on a promise of being able to stand up to Wall Street. So when you are done firing everybody in your cabinet, when you are done getting Ben Bernanke out of that seat and making the Fed go back to its day job of just like setting rates and not making banks bigger and then floating them with federal capital to stay big, when you're done with that, do not listen to Wall Street. Stop taking the meetings with Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon before you take the meetings with Damon Silver. Try to actually understand what it is you can do for this country. You can make the banks smaller. You can bring back Glass-Steagall. You can stop listening to their interests. You can actually be an FDR as opposed to just having resurrected his memory in your election campaigns. And you can actually do something that will help the public um, in a long term and actually give the people who voted for you what they voted for.